as you heard at this meeting, there is a lot of good news in scleroderma. Uh, certainly the outcomes, as Dr. Jimenez highlighted yesterday, have gotten dramatically better compared to uh, one or two decades ago. So that's the good news, but there's no question that many challenges remain, and the fact is that there is still not a single approved therapy for scleroderma. So this is still an orphan disease with not a single licensed drug highlighting the challenges that we have in, in going forward. Uh, so I, I thought about what are some of the key questions that the researchers working around the country are engaging in trying to answer. Uh, a very important and hot area of research is the genetics. Is scleroderma a genetic disease? What does it even mean if it's genetic? Um, and in that sense, how can we use the information we learn from these genetic studies ultimately to improve lives of people with scleroderma? Another line of research is what you might call pathogenesis. Uh, and that's using a variety of methodologies and techniques to try to understand the, the mechanism of disease, of how an injury leads to the, all the clinical complications and clinical manifestations of this disease. What are the key cells, the key molecules, the key pathways uh, that go awry, that become abnormal, and that cause scleroderma? And that directly ties into therapy because rational therapy or targeted therapy is very much based on our understanding of some of these pathways and allows us to then uh, specifically target drugs or interventions to block these abnormal pathways. And finally, a very exciting and emerging area of research is what you might call personalized medicine which is the realization that not every patient with scleroderma is the same. This is a very diverse and heterogeneous disease. And just like in cancer, we need to get more sophisticated and understand better the individual variability in this disease so we can actually match the right kind of treatment to the right patient. So I'll just cover these areas very briefly, and then you'll hear more about them during the panel discussion. So is scleroderma a genetic disease? And this is actually a very complex and difficult question to answer. <clears throat> and I have to acknowledge that Dr. May sitting here on the podium was really one of the very pioneers to even begin to think about the role of, uh, of genetics in scleroderma. So it's a complicated question. Uh, obviously, it's, it's infrequently a familial disease, so it doesn't typically run in families. Nevertheless, if you look at population studies, about 1.6% of people with scleroderma have a first-degree family member uh, who has scleroderma. And in addition, and some of the questions related to this, it's not infrequent to see people with scleroderma who have a family member with another autoimmune disease. Common ones include thyroid disease, multiple sclerosis, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and others. The other interesting line of research is looking at twins. And Dr. Carol Fagali, um, who got an award last night, really did some pioneering studies looking at a large number of twins to see if the other member of the twin pair had scleroderma or not. And what her results showed is that about 4.6% of twins had a fellow twin uh, who had scleroderma. The other 95% did not. And you can interpret that both ways. You can interpret that to say that that strongly points to a genetic tendency. But you could also argue that, well, because 95% of the twins with identical genetic background don't have scleroderma, it, it points to an environmental role. Uh, <clears throat> to look at this in another way, this is just a table showing the relative risk of developing scleroderma. So in the, in the general population, it's about one in 5,000. It's a very rare condition. <clears throat> but if you have a first degree relative, your relative risk goes way up. And if you have an identical twin, the risk goes even higher. So we can definitely conclude that family history of having scleroderma is currently the strongest risk factor for the disease and clearly pointing to an important role in genetics, an important but complex role of genetics in this disease. So how do we go about trying to understand the genetics and, and finding what are the genes that may be involved and, and that may be abnormal or cause susceptibility to this disease? And this is actually a very complex and really daunting task because we have about 30,000 genes. 
but each gene is made up of huge numbers of nucleotides, so we have actually billions of nucleotides. How do you find the needle in haystack and identify those genetic variations that predispose to scleroderma? So just a little primer on some basic uh, genetics. Uh, the human population is highly variable in terms of our genetic makeup. And the genetic code is the DNA, which is shown here as these long sequences of, of nucleotides, which are letters that really encode the genetic information. And what this uh, diagram shows is that, in fact, there's obviously variability in the population. Some people have blue eyes, some people have green eyes, height, hair color, and so on. And these variations are genetically encoded, and they are really related to these uh, variations in single nucleotides. So in this case, this letter changes to a different letter uh, and causes a polymorphism. And we call the single nucleotide polymorphism because it's just one nucleotide change. And there's a huge number of these in the human genome. So the challenge of, of genetic research is to identify those nucleotide changes that are normal variants versus those that are actually predisposing to disease in large numbers of individuals. There are two general strategies to do this. One is the so-called candidate gene approach, where you have a gene that you think would be abnormal, and you carefully study that in a lot of healthy people and people with scleroderma. <clears throat> the more popular and probably more robust way now is to do this on a very large scale in an unbiased manner where you look at essentially every genetic variant across the genome, and there is hundreds of thousands of these, and try to identify which ones are more common in patients compared to people without the disease. And again, that's called genome-wide association studies, or GWAS, and that's a term I think you'll hear increasingly frequently because the, the, the rate of progress in this kind of research is really accelerating. And this is what a genome-wide association study looks like. So you collect a large number of individuals who have a disease, scleroderma, an even larger number of people without the disease. You collect their DNA and look for these variations in these single nucleotide polymorphisms. And then use various powerful computer programs to try to understand which variation is more common in the disease uh, compared to the healthy controls. So Dr. Mays led a really a seminal study a number of years ago, an international collaboration, and this just shows how many people were involved. This is a, a paper that was published and has something like 40 authors, just to show you how extensive and what a large scope this kind of research can be. But in this study, they examined uh, 2,346 patients with scleroderma and an even larger number of individuals without scleroderma. All of these people gave their DNA, and then this DNA was examined across the board to look for about 500,000 genetic variants. So a very, very large and complex and, and extensive study. And what the results showed in this case, and this is a so-called Manhattan plot, this is how often genetic variations are presented. What the study showed is that there was five genes and these are indicated by these red arrows, or genetic loci, or genetic variants, that seem to be much more common in people with scleroderma compared to healthy individuals, or people without scleroderma. Now, important to remember that this doesn't mean that these genes cause the disease. It simply means that these genes are associated with the disease and are essentially risk factors. So if you have these genes, your risk of developing the disease is higher than if you didn't. So there are a lot of these studies going on, and actually a ton of data is being generated, and I think a, a very reasonable question is, how do we use this data, and how does this ultimately actually contribute to better outcome with people with scleroderma? And what the popular press most commonly talks about is simple genetic tests to determine whether you have scleroderma or whether you're going to get scleroderma or not. And this is probably less likely to be successful, and is really impractical for any complex disease that has many, many genes that predispose to it. A better question is to look at genetics and say, if you have scleroderma, can the genetics tell you if you're more likely to develop a particular complication, such as renal disease or pulmonary hypertension? 
More appealing still is use this genetic information in what's called pharmacogenomics, that is, identify people who are more likely to respond to a drug than not, or identify people who are more likely to develop a toxic side effect from a drug. And this type of pharmacogenomics is now actually increasingly used in the clinic. Probably most likely benefit, at least in the short term, will be that these genetic studies give us a much better insight of what actually is going on in these patients at the molecular level, and that will potentially rapidly leave, lead us to uh, identify and discover new drugs that are very specifically targeted. So there is in this, this kind of evolution of utility of this genetic information, but there's no doubt that this information is going to fundamentally change the way we think about these diseases. <clears throat> so where do we stand in terms of understanding the disease based on the genetic and other kind of information? We know that there is definitely a genetic risk, but that's clearly not causal for the disease. It just puts you at a higher risk. And what must be fundamentally important is environmental exposures. And this could take a variety of forms, including diet, drugs, air pollution, occupational exposure. And something we hear more and more about is the microbiome that is the one trillion microorganism that live in our bodies that have a powerful influence on how uh, your health evolves. And the interaction of genetics and environmental exposures then leads to what really is the causative agent, which is the activation of cells throughout the body, particularly in the skin and the lung, fibroblasts. These cells become activated, make too much collagen, and that causes dysfunction of organs like the skin and the lungs and the heart, and ultimately causes a lot of the complications of the disease. And we now have actually reasonable therapies to target these pathways. Uh, and I just listed two of them here, the autologous hematopoietic stem cell therapy that I'll talk about very briefly, and CELCEPT. And these are just two of the currently investigational but widely used uh, interventional approaches that seem to have beneficial effects in downregulating this fibroblast activation. So just a word about uh, stem cell therapy, or the formal name is high-dose immunosuppression with hematopoietic stem cell therapy. <clears throat> and in this procedure, uh, blood is, is drawn from the patient um, and taken out, stored. Then the patient undergoes intensive immunosuppressive therapy to essentially paralyze the immune system and then their own blood cells are given back, or stem cells, to reconstitute the immune system. And there's, in fact, quite a bit of data that in some individuals this approach can be quite effective. Uh, on the left is a recently published study from Northwestern, Dr. Richard Burt's study, uh, a small study with 10 patients treated with this uh, intervention. And you can see that in these patients over a period of one to two years, there was a nice decline in the amount of skin affected. And maybe even more importantly, uh, there was a stabilization on lung function, even, even an improvement in some patients. On the right is another study uh, from the Scott study doing, looking at skin biopsies from before and after stem cell therapy. And in this individual, you can see that the uh, thickness of the dermis and the sclerosis in the skin gets looser, presumably as a response to the therapy, and the skin gets better. Uh, and so this is a, an area of great interest, and there's a number of studies now ongoing. This is just two of them listed. There's others ongoing. These are large multicenter randomized studies, the appropriate way to look at these uh, clinical outcomes. Uh, some of these are already terminated, others are just taking off. They will hopefully give us a much better idea of are these treatments effective, what are the downsides and risk and benefit, and most importantly, who may be the ideal patients that might best benefit from this type of intervention. Now, one of the major advances over the last decade has been identifying a number of molecules from these basic research laboratories that seem to be very important in scleroderma, and I listed some of them here. So things like interleukin-6 or TGF-beta or Wnt are all molecules that seem to be abnormally regulated and, and maybe cause or drive the disease. 
there are also certain cell types like myofibroblast and B cells that seem to be important. And all of these insights are very valuable because they've led to the development of, of novel therapies that specifically target each of these molecules. This is just a table showing some of the current ongoing clinical trials that are specifically targeting these molecules. Uh, there's a study with rituximab, for example, that targets B cells. There are other studies listed here that are either currently ongoing randomized clinical trials or observational clinical trials. Others are still in the pipeline uh, where investigators are still trying to decide which would be the best method to target a particular molecule. So there's a great deal of activity. In fact, if you look on clinicaltrials.gov, which is the uh, NIH-maintained website of all clinical studies, I think there's over 100 studies ongoing looking at various treatments in scleroderma. So in the last few minutes, let me just briefly talk about the concept of personalized medicine and how that might be applicable to scleroderma and, and move the field forward. And, and this is based on the idea that perhaps one of the reasons why many drugs fail, both in the clinical practice and in clinical trials, is that we tend to lump all kinds of patients together. And we, we now know very well from many diseases that if you look at any given diagnosis, there's a very heterogeneous group of patients lumped into that group. So here, patients, let's say people with scleroderma, but in fact, if you look carefully, these individuals are very different. They have different types of scleroderma, different stages of scleroderma, different autoantibodies, and until and unless we start parsing these differences out, we're not going to make much progress even with the existing therapies. So if you treat this group uh, together with a single prescription, a single drug, there are a variety of outcomes that you can experience. You can have uh, drugs that are toxic uh, but help some people. You can have drugs that are toxic, have many side effects, and don't help anybody. You can have drugs uh, that are to uh, toxic and no benefit, or you can have drugs that are the ideal scenario, well tolerated and help most of the patients. And we need to understand better how we can separate out these patients a priori. So the goal of personalized medicine is understanding that every patient with a disease like scleroderma is different, the variable rates of disease progression, different kinds of complications, and obviously very different outcomes. And consequently, not everybody will respond the same way to the same kind of therapy. And this probably explains, to some extent, many of the disappointing results from clinical trials to date. So the challenge is really to be able to predict which patient will respond best to which drug. The best example I can show you for this is from the cancer field. And this is, uh, this is a picture from somebody with, uh, with melanoma, very deadly skin cancer. And it was discovered a number of years ago that about half the patients with melanoma have a mutation in a gene called RAF, BRAF. Uh, and there's a, a drug that very specifically targets this mutation. And if you treat patients who have the mutation with this drug, they have a remarkable response. So here's, this is a PET scan, and here's an individual with widespread metastatic disease uh, at study entry, and within two weeks, with this drug, essentially all the metastatic disease has melted away. Now, if you treated a patient who didn't have this mutation, though, you probably wouldn't see any response. So this is a great example of personalized medicine, and in the cancer field, this is rapidly becoming the current clinical practice. So the challenge in all of these complex diseases is to find this sweet spot uh, to find those patients where the drug will have no toxic effect and will have beneficial effect. And I just want to share with you one study from our group in collaboration with a group at Dartmouth that we completed recently, a very small pilot study, but that suggests the feasibility of this approach. So in this pilot study led by Monique Hinchcliffe in our group, uh, seven patients with early scleroderma were enrolled. Uh, all of these patients had a skin biopsy before entry and then were treated for up to a year or so with Celsept, a very standard therapy. And then we did a skin biopsy after and correlated uh, changes in gene expression to the clinical outcomes. <laughs> 
the, the approach is actually shown here. We do a skin biopsy, and the skin is then taken, the RNA is processed, and submitted to this large-scale genome-wide expression profiling using these microchip arrays. These are arrays that can measure simultaneously 40,000 different mRNAs in a single experiment, so it generates a huge amount of data. And the results you get look something like this. It's a very complicated panel, but just remember that each vertical column represents an individual patient, and each horizontal co column, horizontal row across represents a single gene. Uh, the green represents genes that are present at low levels, and the red represents genes that are present at high levels. And first of all, you can immediately see that it's very variable. Different patients have very different patterns of gene expression. But what was very interesting is when we looked at the responders, so people who got better on the treatment versus people who didn't, there was a definite clustering in the sense that all the patients who got better were in this particular group of biopsies, and all the patients who did not get better were in other groups, indicating that the gene expression profile before treatment can potentially predict which patients will respond to put, uh, this particular drug. Now, it may be different for every drug, but this is just a pilot demonstration. So what we concluded is that the skin biopsies reveal and reflect the heterogeneity of disease that we talked about, where every patient is a little bit different, and more importantly, that potentially we can predict which patient may respond uh, to which therapy. Now, the caveat is this is a very, very small study uh, with just a single drug, and the, one of the critical goals now is to do similar studies, much larger groups of patients, and compare many different kind of drugs so that ultimately we can really have personalized medicine. So just to bring this to a close, scleroderma is a very complex and heterogeneous disease, and it, it's very, very important for us to keep in mind that patients are very variable in their genetic makeup, in, in, in the clinical manifestations in the disease, in the rate of progression of the disease. And so we really need to start thinking more sophisticated about not just how we treat patients, but also even how we design clinical trials, realizing that some drugs will work for some individuals and will not work for others very much like they do in the cancer field. So I will stop there and, and turn it over to the panel. Um, and we have Dr. Maureen Mays from UT Houston, uh, Dr. Jimenez uh, from Jefferson in Philadelphia, and Dr. Lorinda Chung from Stanford. They're all experts in, in various uh, areas of scleroderma, both clinical and, and research, and they'll be up here to, uh, to answer questions. So thank you very much for being up here. Um, so, uh, so people sent in questions, and I have uh, quite a lot of those. And we'll get through some of them, and then if, if there are burning questions or if we have time, hopefully we can answer questions from the floor as well. Um, so uh, many of the questions related to hematopoietic stem cell therapy. It's gotten a lot of press. Clearly there are some impressive results as well as some significant toxicities. And several of the questions wondered about where we stand with this therapy, uh, what, what is the current data show, what are the next steps in, in terms of the research aspects. So, uh, Dr. Mays, could you take this on, speak a little bit about where we are with the stem cell therapies? There are uh, two large multicenter trials, one in Europe called ASTIS, one in the U.S. called SCOT. Uh, the ASTIS trial has been completed and the um, data have been analyzed and it looks, that, it looks like people who have undergone the high-dose chemotherapy and autologous stem cells, so their own stem cells uh, placed back, that those people did very well compared to the people who had sort of standard therapy of lower dose um, uh, immunosuppression with cyclophosphamide or cytoxin. The SCOT trial that was done here in the U.S., uh, is still following patients who, um, to the uh, end point of about four or five years after they initiated therapy. So we don't have the uh, results of our study, of the Scott study, but we do have ASTIS, and it looks very good. 
The uh, issue is that there is a mortality rate associated with this very aggressive therapy. The high-dose chemotherapy is what you expect and what, what you all know about uh, people who have undergone chemotherapy for cancer. Uh, your immune system is wiped out for a period of time before the new cells grow. The red cells, the white cells, the platelets, everything is, is gone. And people, it's a, a very large stress on the body. There is about a 10% mortality rate associated with the actual procedure. And so anyone who is thinking about undergoing this treatment, you really have to think very closely very clearly and for a long period of time and discuss it with your family because it's not something that you just decide, well, today I'm going to get it. Uh, there are fairly, uh, th there's the, the mortality associated with it. And then people are sick and weak for several months following it. So you don't bounce back all that quickly. It should be reserved for people who have very severe disease and who, um, whose risk for dying from the disease is higher than the risk of dying from the treatment. So I think, uh, I think it's very good. I wish we had uh, safer treatments, but I think for a small group of scleroderma patients, especially early on in the disease, that it can be essentially life-saving. Thanks. Um, there's an interesting question here, and maybe I could ask Lori to address this. Uh, calcinosis has been the most challenging part of my disease. Um, what kind of research is being done, and maybe any comments on how we're treating it or any promising new, new ways of treating that? So um, calcinosis is certainly a problem that a lot of our patients suffer from, and um, as part of the scleroderma clinical trials consortium, we developed a working group to concentrate on research in calcinosis. And so um, we've done some recent projects, one of which is just to evaluate how prevalent or how common is uh, calcinosis in scleroderma patients. So it affects about 25% of patients. And, you know, typically we used to think that if those with limited skin involvement phenomenon that were really at risk for calcinosis. Um, but diffuse patients can certainly get calcinosis as well, and it's probably more associated with how long you've had the disease and kind of a source of disease damage. Other studies have also shown that there's an association with digital ulcers, so there's a thought that maybe it's the un underlying blood vessel problem that could be contributing to causing calcinosis. So we're also currently right now developing x-ray uh, scoring systems to be able to evaluate calcinosis in clinical trials for scleroderma. Unfortunately, there aren't uh, very many agents currently available that we think are very effective for calcinosis. Uh, calcium general blockers certainly have been used. Medications that we use to treat osteoporosis or osteopenia like alendronate <coughs> have shown some benefit in a few patients case reports, but not um, any large studies have been done. Another medicine, uh, probenicid, has also uh, been used. It's actually a gout medicine, but it's been shown to be helpful in a small sample of patients with uh, calcinosis. Minocycline is a drug that uh, a lot of scleroderma patients actually go on um, you know, as a disease-modifying drug, which we've used in both scleroderma and dermatomyositis patients with calcinosis that has that kind of red rim around it, so we think that there might be some inflammation surrounding it. And we've actually had some benefit in our patients with minocycline. So, um, like I said, currently there aren't any approved therapies that are really shown to be effective for calcinosis, but um, there is a lot of ongoing research. And uh, Ariane Herrick in the UK in particular is looking at kind of what uh, chemicals are involved in the actual calcium deposits, and hopefully that will help us understand better what causes it, and then find targets that can actually treat it. Okay, here's a, a question. Um, my 31-year-old son has severe morphia, labeled pansclerotic morphia, and, uh, and it's uh, maybe related to inflammation. My question is, what is the research uh, 
in regard to inflammation in, in scleroderma, is there anything new in treatment and research? Uh, Sergio, do you want to take, take, take a crack at that? Yeah, I think this is a very important question because it puts in focus the crucial role of inflammation and the development of uh, inf uh, fibrotic reactions. Uh, Pan-sclerotic morphia is one of these fibrotic reactions. Mimics scleroderma, but it's different. So there are two different groups. Pan-sclerotic morphia belongs to one of the other groups that's not systemic sclerosis. But in all these conditions, as Dr. Varga mentioned, uh, there's uh, an incredible uh, role for an inflammatory process that occurs in the affected tissues. Uh, inflammatory cells can be of different kinds, and we don't really understand exactly what's happening, but these inflammatory cells become activated. Once they become activated, we don't know if it's external stimuli, some environmental agents, and obviously the genetic component has to be there, but once these inflammatory cells become activated, they start to produce all kinds of chemicals. Those chemicals called growth factors, other kinds of proteins, they go to the target cells and produce changes on the target cells that develop the clinical picture. The most important target cells are the fibroblasts, which become transformed into a myofibroblast. And this myofibroblast is cell that produces huge amounts of fibrous tissue, collagens, and other molecules, which ends up causing the scarring in the skin, sclerosis of uh, internal organs, fibrosis in the lungs, and all that. So understanding this inflammatory process is crucial to develop effective therapeutic agents. Unfortunately, it's a very complex process. Uh, there is uh, a lot of effort. There has been uh, really remarkable progress recently with identification of some of those proteins that Dr. Varga mentioned on his slide. Uh, and I hope that in the future, some of this can actually be converted into potential therapeutic agents. And I think there's enough work now being focused on trying to block this important step which is triggering the fibrotic reaction through inflammatory cells. And I think there's a lot of uh, potential, and uh, I'm almost positive that certain effective therapeutic agents may be derived from this problem. Mm -hmm. uh, here's a very interesting question. Is research, uh, research dev devoted to drug treatment only, or is there any ongoing research on what might cause, what might cause the disease? Has anyone researched how nutrition can affect scleroderma? So I think part of the question is, you know, what uh, we, we talked about the genetic susceptibility, but clearly environmental exposures uh, are, are important. So Maureen, can you take a crack at that? Well, I think um, as Dr. Varga mentioned, there's a great deal of uh, research that is being directed toward the pathways, the genetic pathways and the inflammatory pathways that interact in order to uh, result in the changes that we call the disease scleroderma. In terms of nutrition, uh, I don't think that nutrition plays a very important role in triggering scleroderma. And, and the reason I say that is that I've uh, seen scleroderma patients, certainly in the U.S., from all different kinds of backgrounds, also in Europe, and we have uh, a collaboration with um, a university in China, and I've seen Chinese patients in, uh, with very severe scleroderma. And of course, if you look at the diet in China versus the diet in the U.S., it is very different. So it doesn't seem to make a lot of difference if people are vegetarian or if they eat a high-fat diet, like a Western diet or a low-fat diet, which is typical in China and other Asian countries, they still get scleroderma. So the, once somebody has scleroderma, does nutrition matter? I think that's a separate question, and I think the answer, the answer to the first one, no, nutrition doesn't matter in terms of risking, uh, increasing your risk for disease, but once you have the disease, it's very important to uh, have um, a, a good nutritious diet. I don't think that limited diets, not uh, gluten-free diets or other things that um, people uh, 
feel might improve their overall health, it's uh, important to eat a very uh, uh, balanced diet. From the, uh, however, at that point, people are very individual. Uh, I, I am aware of uh, stories from patients who say that they changed their diet and they started to say a gluten-free diet and feel so much better, but when you ask them what was their diet like prior to it, and they were eating essentially a lot of junk. So of course, if you go from a junk food diet to a very nutritious diet with fresh fruits and vegetables and that sort of thing, you're going to feel better. If People have difficulty swallowing or digesting food, as many scleroderma patients do. You have to modify your diet in order to accommodate those things. Um, at that point, it might be difficult to really get the nutrition that you need if you have to uh, eat a very soft diet or uh, avoid certain fruits and vegetables. It's a challenge to have uh, uh, a good nutritious diet, but uh, I don't think in terms of causing the disease, it really is associated. Okay. Um, here's an interesting question. I, ha I have been reading a lot about antibiotic protocols online. Uh, this form of treatment relies on antibiotics to help alleviate symptoms. What does the research show in regards to the effectiveness of antibiotics and how does this compare to other types of treatment? Lori, do you want to take that? So um, I mentioned minocycline um, being used as a disease-modifying therapy for scleroderma. And there have been large trials showing that it's successful, but definitely I have patients who feel better on it and certainly um, have experienced some skin uh, softening with it. Um, you know, we don't have a comparison to patients treated with placebo, so it's hard to say whether they would get better on their own. Um, other antibiotics might be indicated if patients have GI bacterial overgrowth, which is a common problem in scleroderma, and certainly uh, rotating antibiotics um, with romycin and ciprofloxacin might be necessary to treat bacterial overgrowth. Um, other than that, um, you know, I, I would say that we don't routinely use antibiotics to treat systemic sclerosis, and um, so there's no real comparison between being on antibiotics um, compared to any of the more powerful anti-inflammatory medications that we're using. Here's an interesting question. Uh, fecal incontinence is a frustrating thing for anyone to go through, especially at my young age. Uh, with the ways that scleroderma affects the bowel, it can be common and embarrassing experience. Is there any research going on that addresses different ways uh, why this comes about and how it might be treated? Uh, and I know, Sergio, you've done some research uh, in that area. Maybe you can take this on. Yes, uh, mentioned in the question of fecal incontinence is one of the less known manifestations of systemic sclerosis, scleroderma but it can have really dramatic uh, damaging effects on the quality of life. Uh, it's really a very serious problem, although not many patients are affected, but uh, it's a serious problem because it's an uncontrollable loss of uh, normal functions and can be embarrassing and uh, particularly can really occur at any time uh, causing problems with uh, you know, quality of life, with functioning in the job, uh, even at, at home. So it's a very, very important problem from that uh, viewpoint. Uh, unfortunately, we don't really understand exactly what the mechanisms that lead to this uh, complication uh, are, but uh, we have performed recent studies uh, in our group uh, and we believe that there might be some opportunity to pursue this. Uh, we have found that there are some antibodies that patients with scleroderma make, and these antibodies affect the contractility of the cells that are supposed to close the sphincters. So the cells that are supposed to close the sphincters are called smooth muscle cells, and they have some receptors on the surface that would tell the cell to contract so they close the sphincter. And we found one antibody that, in fact, may block that uh, message. So the cells, instead of contracting, they just stay open and they're relaxed and they cannot close the sphincters. So if we demonstrate that this is uh, the case, uh, we may be able uh, 
uh, just like Dr. Varga mentioned, uh, identify the antibody in the circulation of these patients and develop some effective therapies that may actually prevent this problem. Uh, previously, it was always thought that maybe the sphincter problem was like an end stage fibrotic alteration of the sphincter and there was nothing that could be recovered. But uh, I now have a feeling that perhaps some of the function can be recovered and if we find that this antibody in fact produces this effect, it may be a way to initiate the, the attack to try to improve this very, very uh, disturbing symptom. Um, this one harks back to some of what I earlier said, but obviously of great interest. Uh, I was told by my doctor that there's no genetic link to scleroderma. I find this interesting because I was diagnosed recently and my mother was diagnosed 20 years ago. Uh, ha has there been an evolving thought on whether or not scleroderma is genetic? So Maureen, you've, you've done some of the pioneering work in this area. Uh well, I, I think there definitely is a genetic component. It's not a single gene. It is probably a combination of multiple genes. And not everybody who gets those genes will get scleroderma. It has to be um, an interaction between the background genetic component and what that, that trigger in the environment. Um, I also have, um, a, when I was at Wayne State in Detroit, uh, there was a, a family, a young girl uh, in her 20s who developed scleroderma, and then later on, and I don't believe it's the same people who, uh, or the same family that submitted the question, but at a, a later time, her mother developed scleroderma. And it may not have been 20 years later, but it was several years. And I think it was probably, the way I rationalize that, is that both the mother and the daughter share uh, a lot of their genes, but that the mother, at a later time in her life, ran across the environmental trigger that caused her disease, whereas the daughter experienced that earlier in life. So yes, there is that component but uh, the risk is low. However, if it happens to you and your family, then the, it's 100%. So uh, it, it, it's, I know, a difficult thing to live with, and many of my patients ask, well, will my children get this? The chances are small, but not zero. So in that regard, and I know we've, we've spoken, I recently saw a gentleman with a new onset scleroderma, and he said he has an identical twin who has, who, who has no scleroderma, and we in fact contacted the twin, and he's healthy. So how do you explain that? Here are two individuals with 100% genetic identity. They are identical twins. What, what would be the explanation for that? Well, the, um, the explanation uh, would be that, again, that the, whatever it is in the environment that caused the disease to become expressed uh, that, that made those genes um, become active or perhaps silent in some ways, but the balance has changed in the immune system. Uh, that the one twin experienced that, that it likely, and, and I believe uh, these individuals are now in their 50s, so it probably was not an environmental exposure that occurred when they were young children because pretty much kids in a family will share the same infections, the same viruses, the, the same allergens, the same toxins. Mm -hmm. So they were okay and pretty much identical in terms of their immune system up to the point where they left the home and then started to experience different things in the environment. So the twin A with the disease experience the trigger. Twin B will not if he never has that trigger. And it's, I know it's, it's, it's um, uh, frustrating for families and difficult for physicians. But people want to know, well, what do I avoid? How do I change things? And if we don't know what that trigger is, there is no way that we can give them any advice. So the challenge really is to try to find the environmental trigger. Yes, in these cases. yes. And, and I think from a genetic point of view and a gene activity or expression point of view, those types of families are incredibly important for us to study. To see, uh, number one, are they identical? And most people with an identical twin know it uh, because they've, they've really, it's, it's more than just the, uh, the familial uh, 
features that are similar that you can tell when they're identical, but we can also test that uh, in the lab to make sure that that's the case. And then to look at their genes and to look at their gene expression pattern to see what is different in the affected twin that's uh, from the unaffected twin. Okay. Maybe last question, and then if we have time, we can open it up to the floor. But a very interesting uh, question. Um, when I read about the research being done, it seems like the topics and types of research are very scattered. Is there a centralized group of people that come together to speak about what kind of research should be done? Is there a 10-year plan as to what needs to be explored and, and focused? So this is very interesting. Maybe. Or you could take a stab at it, and I'm sure everyone else would want to comment on that also. Yeah, so definitely um, the scleroderma research community works together, and um, there are several international um, committees or, or groups that are working together and trying to determine what research areas we should focus on in the upcoming years. Um, the Scleroderma Clinical Trials Consortium has been um, in existence for uh, probably 20 years or so um, and continues to grow and we have identified various areas that have not really had much research done, um, including calcinosis, to concentrate on. So those include um, the heart, um, the joints, um, the muscles, um, and I'm missing any? Calcinosis is the, the fourth one. And um, in addition, we recently had a meeting in Italy bringing together uh, multiple investigators throughout the world to again focus on um, what points we should focus on in terms of upcoming research. Um, GI involvement was another thing that um, is, is of great interest and a lot of research is being done in that area right now. Maureen or Sergio, do you want to comment? Uh... Uh, well, uh, this is very timely because next week a large group of us will be getting together in Boston for the um, biannual Scleroderma International Workshop. This is a very basic science mechanistic meeting uh, where people will be presenting their work. We've tried to keep it small. The first meeting, I think, was in Chicago in the late 1980s. I think I missed the first one, but I was there at the second one. There were 34 of us. Uh, and that was pretty much everybody interested in scleroderma in research. The world. Not just the U.S., in the, world. the world. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, for next weekend, I think they limited it to 400 individuals. And there are some, uh, there will probably be a little bit more than 400, as some others have sort of squeezed in at the last minute. But uh, it really shows that there uh, is international collaboration, people who are very interested in this disease and who try to get together and in a fairly informal kind of way present their work and get feedback from other people. And uh, even it, it's very hard to keep up with the literature of what's going on in our field. It's much, uh, it's easier if you go to a, a two or three day meeting and find somebody who's doing work very similar to what you're doing and then go and talk to them and just have this give and take in a more informal way to find out what they're doing, what they think, what the ideas are. And uh, it's, it's just tremendously important in order to uh, really make progress in this disease. Well, perhaps I just uh, should mention briefly that in Europe there's also a very strong collaborative study uh, the Eustar group, the European Scleroderma uh, Consortium, and uh, they are very strong there. In fact, uh, the, there are many centers in the United States that participate in some of the projects, uh, and that's very consolidated, very strong group, and uh, they're doing quite a bit of both clinical and uh, uh, basic research on the pathogenesis of scleroderma, and I think it's very important uh, to, to participate on those groups as well. So it sounds like there's quite a lot of integration and coordination of research. Um, good. I, I think we still have time, a little couple of minutes. If there's any questions from the audience, uh, uh, take advantage of our fantastic panel here. Yes, I see a hand up there. With regards to the bowel incontinence, um, I'm now on Resolor so that I can have the bowel movements. Uh, and when I do, it's called get out of my way. It's still somewhat infrequent. It does not mean that they're loose stools as they're normal stools. 
is there anything else that I can do to help with the incontinence when it, things do finally occur? Uh, well, as I mentioned, it's a tough problem. Uh, there are ways to perhaps try to help, uh, at least with the bowel movements, uh, to uh, change the diet. Uh, occasionally, there's uh, bacterial overgrowth that was mentioned already that may accelerate or make, make this problem a little bit worse. So treatment of bacterial overgrowth uh, sometimes helps. And there are a number of uh, medications that may help trying to control that problem a little bit better. But uh, it is a, a very difficult situation, and uh, I hope there's some research and some new development to help with that problem. Do you, do you have experience with biofeedback? Uh, is that work, people? Uh, we have heard of some patients where biofeedback uh, uh, apparently was effective, but uh, talking to the uh, investigators who actually measure the uh, nerve stimulation to the to the sphincter and to the smooth muscle, uh, they think that the influence may not be that dramatic. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious. I've read that uh, the Choctaw Native Americans have a high prevalence of scleroderma, and in the research, have they identified any triggers for that particular population? Uh, I think Dr. Mays was part of that study, so maybe, Maureen, you could address that, the Choctaw Indians. Yeah, uh, that's a fascinating story, and actually it was the Choctaw and that observation that in this fairly small uh, community of people that there was more scleroderma than uh, uh, would be expected. And the way that happened, I think it's, a, it's an interesting story. There was... Um, a rheumatology fellow in training with uh, Dr. Frank Garnett at the University of Texas in Houston, where I am now. And um, as part of uh, his payment for medical school, he uh, owed the government some time, and he was assigned to the Indian Health Service and sent to Oklahoma. And uh, because of Dr. Arnett's interest in scleroderma, he had a lot of experience with it, and but thought, well, I'm going to go to this small clinic in uh, this remote area, and I'll probably never see scleroderma again. Again. Uh, and instead, he saw a fair number of cases, and that led to this study that proved that there was a high prevalence of scleroderma in that group. That um, would suggest that there was a, a genetic component to it, because the Choctaw uh, actually uh, were not native to Oklahoma, but they um, it, uh, originated in the southeast U.S., in Mississippi, Florida, that area, and then were rather forcibly removed from that area to the reservation in Oklahoma. But they didn't go randomly. They went by kinship groups. Many people died on the way so that there was a small group of people that ended up in Oklahoma, and there was intermarriage. So uh, the, the genes, and, and they took with them the risk genes for scleroderma, of course, unbeknownst to them, and that was magnified in the population because of the intermarriage, because the group became fairly small when they got to Oklahoma. Um, is there something then in the environment in Oklahoma that triggered it, that, that uh, triggered the expression of the disease in this group that now is uh, enriched for the genetic risk factors? They, um, uh, there was an attempt to look at that, but in term, uh, but in the end, um, the results are pretty much negative. It does not seem that they had any known exposures that were different from the uh, environment in uh, the southeast U.S. or different from uh, non-Choctaw Indians um, uh, in the general population in Oklahoma. So I think that remains a mystery. Uh, yeah, it, since the pulmonary fibrosis is the biggest killer of people with this disease, what percent of the research is directed toward that and what's, is there anything real promising going on? Uh, we are very uh, interested in interstitial lung disease exactly for that reason, because um, it, uh, it, it carries a poor prognosis, uh, and uh, it also is 
good for a clinical trial because with pulmonary function tests and with high resolution CAT scans, you can measure it. So you know when people are better, worse, or the same. Uh, the scleroderma lung study looked at cyclophosphamide, and that was helpful in scleroderma. It was not as helpful as we would have liked, but at least it showed that, yes, for a period of time, uh, it, it, those people who were on it stabilized, their lungs didn't get worse, uh, as opposed to the people on placebo, but that effect seemed to fade after a year and a half or so. So perhaps uh, one take home message from that is that if people are started on cyclophosphamide and treated for a period of time, perhaps they should go on another immunosuppressive agent, not as severe, or doesn't have the same high risk of side effects as long term cyclophosphamide in order to maintain that improvement. And that led to that, the results of that study led directly to a follow up study that is comparing cyclophosphamide with mycophenolate, another immunosuppressive drug, also known as Celsept. Uh, and that study is ongoing. We should have an answer in a year or a year and a half to see if Celsept is as good uh, or um, yeah, with fewer side effects than the cyclophosphamide. There uh, are other studies that are ongoing. Uh, that the drug companies are interested in treating this condition and interested in developing drugs that might be helpful. There's a, a new study that's going to be getting underway with another medicine called perfenidone that might be helpful. So uh, I, I think there's a lot of interest, but research is slow and it is frustratingly slow for both patients and physicians. We, um, we very much need new agents, but those agents have to be rational. It has to be based on the, the targets that we've identified genetically and in mechanistic studies, the pathways that lead to fibrosis. Where in that pathway can we block, can we develop a drug that will block the uh, fibrosis, and we can identify patients early on and give them the drug and prevent a lot of the damage that tends to be irreversible in the lungs. I think one of the, the uh, uh, good developments is that a lot of lung doctors who have been focusing on idiopathic lung disease and have done ve very good work are now really becoming interested in scleroderma. So we see a lot of them now come to our meetings and talking to each other. And while there's clearly scleroderma lung disease is clearly not exactly the same as idiopathic, there's a lot of overlap, and there's this dialogue. And I think we're going to see, you know, a number of studies of drugs that are used in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis in scleroderma as well. Uh, as she mentioned, there's one drug that's actually now approved, the first drug that's approved in Europe, pyrfenidone, and we hope to start a smallish clinical trial of that very shortly. So. There's still not a great drug, but I think it's, uh, there's a lot of hope on the horizon, a lot of activity there. Yes, my question was, uh, my sister and I are 15 months apart, and we both have scleroderma, and then we met another set of sisters here that are 18 months apart and both have scleroderma. Um, I have applied to numerous studies um, and only gotten two responses. And I understand what you're saying about it. It takes a while and it's a slow process, but how do we let you know that we're completely serious? We'll do anything. Um, I think you, you have the right person sitting here and I'm sure you'll be able to talk to her. Uh, these studies are actually very, very complicated and very, very expensive, but because as Dr. Mays pointed out, these are critically important because of the information they may reveal, they, they need to be done. Yes. Uh, sickle cell as a gene is protective, but also bad. Is there anything about the genes in scleroderma that's good? Yeah. Well, you know, there, there, there's, I'm not really aware of, but there's one gene that, again, Dr. May studied, the, the macrophage inhibitory factor, or MIF, which is very prevalent, and it, it is prevalent because just like sickle cell disease, it does seem to have some role in, in malaria. But other than that, I'm not aware of any direct uh, link there. Yeah, uh, well, I think the fact that these gene variants have persisted in the population imply that there are good effects, that there are advantages to having them. But perhaps in 
what was important uh, a thousand years ago in terms of survival now becomes um, uh, a negative factor because you're, uh, it, before the era of antibiotics, when most people died of infections and there were a lot of bacterial infections, uh, if you had a very strong and active immune system, that was, a good, that was good for your survival. But now, in our fairly clean Western world, if you have a very active immune system, perhaps that's not so good. Perhaps that predisposes you to autoimmune disease. So yes, I, I think that's two sides of the same coin, that a gene can be helpful and beneficial in a certain environment, but can be uh, negative in a different kind of environment. OK, I think we have come to an end. I want to thank uh, the, uh, the panel for their discussion, and I want to thank the audience for being patient and sitting through this. Thank you. <laughs>